Okay, let's get started with lecture. We had some technical difficulties, but those seem to have been resolved. So I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving break. Welcome back. Um, and I guess we're basically officially in the last week of class. So we only have two more lectures to go. We're a little bit behind schedule-wise because of the class that was canceled because of the smoke and the fires. I hope um, everyone is doing okay. I know a bunch of people in class were affected both by the smoke as well as families who were affected by the fires. So I hope everyone's doing okay. Please hang in there. Because of the fires and because of, you know, all of the change of schedule that we had to do around that, all of you should now have one extra homework drop. So, you know, if stuff happened because of smoke, you couldn't make it to campus, you were taking care of other things. Everyone has been given an extra homework drop. We have also changed the discussion policy to give you two extra discussion drops um, to be eligible for the clobber. This is because of, again, because of the fact that classes were canceled, because of the fact that yesterday there was apparently an actual fire in Echeverry Hall. Um, and so, um, you know, we will be holding an official discussion on Monday of RRR week because of the schedule being shifted forward. We will be taking attendance. So if you need to make up some attendance, you're getting an extra opportunity to make up your discussion as well as a homework, as well as two drops. So please keep this in mind. Just a quick reminder, lecture has started. I ask that you all please, you know, be mindful in class and focus on lecture, not on Facebook. Um, what else? Homework 13 is going to be due on Friday. So that's the last homework. And... Homework 13 and homework 12 have been, you know, increasingly challenging as the class has been going on. And one of the reasons is that we're finally getting to kind of the climax of this course where you're being able to put together various different concepts. And so, for example, uh, the last homework is a large number of actually design problems where you're putting together different types of concepts um, and design is something that is not just something that we are th talking about in the context of circuits, in the context of module two, but actually today's lecture, we're going to be thinking about algorithm design. And we're going to think about applying the principles that we learned from taking something that is vague and large and, you know, not clearly specified to being able to develop something specific as an algorithm. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to develop, develop the algorithm of orthogonal matching pursuit, which is one of the most commonly used algorithms in machine learning. It's a classic example of what is called unsupervised learning. So let me write that down, which is today, what are we going to do? We're going to be talking about orthogonal matching pursuit p u r s u i t yeah and what this is as i said is it's a very classic example of what is called unsupervised and what does unsupervised learning mean Any ideas? Yeah? You try to cluster a data set without labels. Like, where is data set and labels coming in? We're just talking about learning. Like, let's not even, we're not even necessarily talking about machine learning. Data set labels is very advanced. What does it mean to be unsupervised? Yeah? Yeah, right, such a... Learning without somebody watching, okay? <laughs> That's a good, a good answer. Yeah, it's learning without having specific 
training examples, specific examples that you can pattern match to. And a lot of the big, you know, excitement that is happening around machine learning these days is coming from advances in what we call both supervised learning as well as unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is when you give someone, um, like uh, was pointed out, a data set, for example, of a bunch of cat videos. And you say, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat. And then you show it a picture of something else furry. And you ask, is this a cat? That is what is called supervised learning because you're being given examples and then you're being asked to extrapolate. But if you're trying to learn something about a data set or about an image or about a measurement without being given a concrete example of what you're trying to learn, this is what is called unsupervised learning. And it's traditionally the hardest kind of learning because you don't have concrete examples. So what you saw in least squares, remember you did all the homework problems where you predicted things, right? For example, we did the stock price prediction last time in class. What that was was an example of supervised learning. So you were given some data, and then you were asked to predict based on that something else about some other data point. What we're going to talk about today is, well, what if you're trying to learn something about a data set without actually being given uh, a priori information. The big kind of, one of the cool things we're going to do today is we're going to try and break what we think of as the N equations, N unknowns barrier. So what we've been thinking about every single time is, well, if I have n unknowns, I need to have n equations uh, to be able to say anything about these unknowns. And what we're going to see in this algorithm is actually if we can extract information about a system given certain structure or other properties, sometimes we can do better. Sometimes we can learn something where there's many, many unknowns. Like in the example we'll consider today, we'll have something like 2,000 unknowns. But we might be able to learn something about this with far fewer equations than uh, 2,000. And that is something that is fundamentally um, the cool part of engineering. This is why it's important to think about the mathematics and the linear algebra and the system theory behind things. Because without understanding the concepts, without understanding rigorously why these algorithms work, you're not going to be able to do things where, for example, you can reduce the number of equations required to actually um, understand something about many more unknowns. To be able to have this, um, have this kind of power where you're getting more from the data set than is actually given to you, you need some kind of deeper understanding of the structure of the data set or uh, fundamental things under underlying the underlying the structure. So I really want to think about this basically as a design problem. And today's lecture is going to be really kind of a very large demo. And we're going to be going back and forth a lot interactively between an IPython notebook. So it's important that you folks, you know, pay attention. It, it'll be easy to get lost. There'll be a bunch of notation. So if something is unclear on the notation, if something in the code is unclear, please feel free to just uh, stop, check in with your neighbor. You know, if your neighbor is also lost, then make sure you stop me, and uh, let's make sure that we're all together on the same page. Okay. So that's that. Oh, one other thing. Reminders. Before I start, um, I told you about the homework drops and the discussion drops. Um, the other thing is that we have an HKN representative coming in uh, at the end of class today to do the uh, departmental survey for the, for the class. So please stay. Please do answer the survey. It's really important for us to get feedback. I have not checked about the internal survey 
um, if we manage to hit 75% or not. I know it closed last night. So we will let you know next lecture about the internal survey. Um, and last thing I forgot to mention about scheduling, uh, RRR week, we will be having a very large number of review sessions. Um, again, there was, you know, there's been a gap. You've all been gone for a week. There's been no class. This is your time to catch up. We will be available, and I please, please, please ask you to come, reach out, come to office hours, ask us questions, like, you know, get ready for the final. Use the resources, because we're going to try and make um, all of the TAs and all of the staff, I will be available, Vladimir will be available. We'll all be around to try and, you know, really have a last push before the final. It's one more week, and um, make sure you use it well. Okay, with that, let's actually get into the details of what we're going to talk about today, which is designing the OMP algorithm. So this whole module has been about learning signals and learning messages that different beacons or transmitters are trying to send to us. And we're going to build on this in the OMP case. Here I want to think in particular about a situation where we have many, many thousands of transmitters. In the GPS situation, we had 24 satellites, right? 24 is not a very large number. It's not a very small number. It's kind of a medium-sized number. But if you think about um, the Internet of Things, how many people have heard of this terminology, Internet of Things? Yeah, so think about your home where you have a central device where different things are talking to it, like your fridge is talking to a central box, and your microwave is talking to a central box, and your toaster is talking to a central box, and, I don't know, your water bottle is talking to a central box, and your pen is talking to the central box, and the paper you're writing on is talking to a central box, and your earrings are talking to a central box. Everything is talking to a central box. I don't know what they're saying to each other, but they're saying stuff. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand what they're saying. Of course, they might not all be talking at the same time. You know, maybe your pen and your paper might be transmitting at the same time, but maybe your microwave is not going to be transmitting at the same time. Your microwave and your coffee cup might try to transmit at the same time if you're warming your uh, coffee in the morning or something like that. So what we're going to try and do, our goal is going to be to decode or learn individual messages from transmitters given a combination of messages at the receiver. And we've kind of talked about this problem in the GPS context already, right? We have a lot of satellites that are transmitting simultaneously, and we're trying to get our distance from these satellites one by one. The GPS problem that you, know, you all did on the last homework, um, I think, was just um, one of the, my favorite problems in the entire class. And we're going to be building on it a lot in this particular lecture. So in case you haven't had a chance to uh, in case you haven't had a chance to like really understand it, please make sure you go back and think about it. This is a problem we wrote, the pilot. Like I wrote this the first time the class was ever offered, and it's been a staple of like it's been a staple homework problem that we've given every single year, for the very reason that it is kind of so fundamental to many different aspects of this course. It's actually one of the problems that inspired bringing OMP into the into the class material itself. So this is our goal. We're thinking about the background of you know, the Internet of Things with many, many devices talking. And we want to do this. We want to have this decoding happening with 
a limited number of observations or equations. We want to not have to, you know, wait every time, oh, you know, let me pause and check if the microwave is transmitting. Oh, then let me pause and check if the coffee is transmitting. Yeah, maybe the coffee wants to transmit too, I'm not sure. Maybe let's pause and wait if the coffee cup is transmitting. If we keep pausing and waiting and we have, you know, thousands of devices in the house, we will just run out of time, right? Somehow we have to have a way by which everyone can transmit simultaneously and still us be able to react and decode um, what's going on in real time. And so what is a code that would have, has been used by devices to transmit simultaneously that you've all seen? We're going to use this code again. You saw it on the homework in the GPS problem. What was it called? Gold codes, right? Gold codes are these sequences of uh, plus, and mi plus and minus ones. And they're binary sequences because there's only two symbols. And what are some of the important properties of gold codes that you used very heavily um, in the homework, right? Let's say SI and SJ are two gold codes. What do we know about the inner product of two gold codes? We know that the inner product of two gold codes, if I is not equal to J, is about zero. What this symbol means, means approximately. Right? We know that when we took the inner product of one gold code with another gold code, what you got was these like really low values. What happened when you took also the inner product of a shifted version of the gold code? So if I have SI, let's say shifted by tau I, so this tau is the shift. This is the code. And I have sj, tau j. What did we want at different shifts? If tau i and tau j are not the same, what did we want for the inner product of uh, these two codes? Hearing whispers, but like no one's actually speaking up. Zero. zero, right? We also wanted this to be approximately zero. Why? Because we wanted it so that when you hit the right shift, you will get a peak so that you can actually decode the time delay between the transmission, right? And we wanted to find the time delay so that we can find the distance. And so the most important thing was that SI, inner producted with itself, SI, is equal to, is the same no matter what the shift is. Tau I, if I have SI at tau I, these are the same now. What is this equal to? This is just the norm of SI squared, right? And we wanted this to be large. In particular, if your gold code is of length capital N, what is going to be the norm squared of the gold code? I have plus and minus ones. I have n of them, and I'm squaring every element. What do I get? 1 squared plus 1 squared plus minus 1 squared plus dot 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 plus minus 1 squared. And I have n of these. This is equal to n. Right? So I get, when I inner product with myself, I get something that's really large, which is why you saw this like little bit of noise and then a the sudden peak. But when I inner product with something else, either a different shift or a different code, I get something really small. Question. So 
Okay, just to clarify, yeah, good question. Um, when I have two different values of shifts, is that the same signal or the different signal? It should work either way. Whether I have the same signal or the different signal. Oh, you can't see my hand. My, yeah, I's and J's are hard to distinguish. Thank you. This is I. This is I. Um, this is I. This is I. This is also true if I rise to write this as... S i tau i s j tau j. Is that clear? Basically, we only get a high value if we get the right code and the right shift. But if I mess up the shift, or if I mess up the signal, or if I mess up both, I'm going to get a low inner product. Is that clear? That was a good question. If my, especially because the handwriting wasn't clear at all. Everyone with me? OK. So now, let's say, in the case of the you know, Internet of Things device, in addition to transmitting its delay, the device wants to communicate a message with you. And this is what we call modulation. So in addition to transmitting this SI, my peanut butter is also going to send this message alpha I along with it. What is alpha I? Alpha I is, let's say, some real number. Which is the message that is being transmitted. In the case of the peanut butter, it might be the temperature or the amount that's left in the jar or how hungry it's feeling. It can be whatever you want it to be. But let's say in addition to figuring out the shift, I want to also figure out the value of this particular um, alpha i. How am I going to figure this out and what is going to happen? So if we go back to our setup, I have these multiple different transmitters that are transmitting, or maybe if I draw this like jar of peanut butter. I don't know if I can draw a jar of peanut butter. Um, and you're transmitting to this central box. And this guy is sending maybe alpha 1, S1. And this guy is sending alpha 2, S2. And this guy is sending alpha 3, S3. So what I'm going to receive is going to be y is equal to alpha 1, S1, plus alpha 1, S1 at shift, tau 1, because there'll be some delay. Alpha 2, S2 at shift, tau 2, plus alpha 3, S3 at shift, tau 3. Right? And I can write this as, so I have a linear combination of vectors. What is my favorite way to write these? I can rewrite this also as S1, at shift tau 1, S2, at shift tau 2, S3, at shift tau 3, times alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, is equal to y. So this is where we're going to start introducing a lot of notation. Please keep track. This is I'm going to try and you know follow the notes very carefully so you can go and look at the notes as well. Um, I don't want to go exactly according to notes because I want to give you like a slightly different perspective so that you can choose whichever interpretation makes more sense to you. But um, Make sure you're keeping track of what is a shift, what is the signal number, what is the device number, um, so on and so forth. So here, this guy is the message. This tau is the shift. And this s is the code. And 
When we multiply the signal by this real number alpha, this is what is called modulation. And this is what also you guys explored in the uh, gold codes problem on the homework, right? You were able to decode in certain cases what that real number that was a scaling was actually, uh, what, 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 what was being sent in, in, in that real number, right? So in this case, now you are looking at this, you know, somewhat complicated problem. We had to figure out how to understand alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 from this setup. So what is known here? What are the things that we know? Anyone? Someone at the back? What are the things that we know in this system of equations? Yeah, at the back? The gold codes. What we know is the gold codes. So we know, what do we know? Do we know, we know S1, S2, and S3, right? But do we entirely know this matrix? Is, this some, is there something here that is unknown as part of this matrix? The shifts, right? These guys are actually unknown. What else is unknown? The alphas are unknown. So these guys are also unknown. Y, on the other hand, this Y over here, this guy is known. Right? So in this particular setup, we have six unknowns, at least, that we've identified, right? And how many equations do we have? What is the length of S1? Let's say it has n symbols. The length of S1 is this capital N, right? Over here. So we have here capital N equations, but they're in this weird format, right? It's not like all of our unknowns are stacked in this vector. They're kind of like the unknown is somehow determining the arrangement or the permutation of the matrix here. So it's similar to stuff we've seen before, but it's not exactly like the stuff that we've seen before, right? And so when you see something that is unfamiliar, uh, but kind of familiar, what do we always do in this class? There's like one approach. One answer is like Gaussian elimination. The other answer, now that you have two answers, is least squares. But now there is the more general answer, right? Which is when you see something complicated, what do you do? You simplify. You solve something simpler. So what is the simpler problem here? So let's consider now if we had only one thing transmitting. So if I had just, just one transmitter. So let's say y was equal to alpha 1 s 1 tau 1. And I want to figure exactly out what alpha 1 and tau 1 are. So take a minute, you know, think about it, talk to your neighbor, see what you might want to try and do. Okay, any suggestions? Any thoughts?
Is it similar to the problem you've seen before? So the rest of what I'm going to do in class is going to be a somewhat detailed demo. So please try to, to follow along. And what we're going to talk through is how we might first solve this first signal problem, like this single signal problem. Are there anyone who, anyone who has any ideas that they might like to share about how we want to go about doing this? Someone else? Someone who has an answer. Yeah. Hopefully you collaborated. Okay, so what he said was, you know, basically, if I can interpret it, pretend alpha didn't really exist, right? Just do the cross correlation you would anyway. And because at, you know, all of the shifts that are wrong, you're going to get this cross correlation that is very small, you're going to have the same thing happen even if there's an alpha, because alpha times zero is still going to be something very close to zero. And that's what we're going to try and do. So what we have here, is, can people at the back read this? I actually really want you to try and look at this because if, like, just looking at the plots um, isn't going to give you as much as if you try to follow along with what's happening. So here, what this signature, signature length, basically this variable is saying what this capital N is. So this is 400. And let's say we have, you know, 200, 2,000 users. And, you know, Let's say we're going to look at this particular interest, 1,500, um, just for cakes. If you want to look at a different index, we can look at a different index. What do you want to look at? We can look at index, like, I don't know, 29. It's a different gold code, right? Each of these, what is it generating? It's generating uh, this set of plus and minus ones, which is what your gold code is, right? And now what we're doing here is we're saying, let us take this gold code and shift it by 100, right? That's what np.roll does. So we're shifting it. And then we're correlating it with itself at different shifts. And we're correlating it with some other gold code at different shifts, right? We had these properties of gold codes. Now we're actually going to see what they are like. You've already looked at this, but we're just doing it together. So what happens when we actually plot this? So what is this? The, the x-axis here is the shift index, right? And we're shifting from 0 to 400, because that's the length of our signal after this is basically periodic. And what we're plotting here is the normalized correlation value. What am I normalizing by? I'm normalizing by n, which is 400, which is the length of the signal, right? Because otherwise, my cross correlation, the larger my Single, signal, the longer my signal, the larger the cross correlation, right? So I'm just dividing by that constant 400. So what do you see here? This is very small, very small, very small, close to zero, except for at which shift? 100, right? Because we're, we're aligning these two, we're shifting one by 100 and seeing which shift matches 100. Well, the shift that matches 100 is shift 100, right? Not surprising. What the yellow signal is, is the cross correlation at different shifts between the signal of choice. What, we, what did we choose? We chose 29. And some other gold code. Here I chose 20, but you could do it with any other gold code. And what you see here is that these values are all very close to zero, right? This was very large. There was a clear peak. And so if you superimposed these or just added these signals together, what you would get was this like, you know, grassy stuff at the bottom and this very tall peak, right? So, great. Now what we're going to do, we're going to say, well, let us now include this alpha. So what signal strength is, is the value of the alpha. So I do that. And now my received signal, which is my signal y, is signal strength, basically, times the code. And now I'm going to see if I can actually extract the signal. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this exactly by doing the correlation. 
So what is this loop doing? It's basically finding the maximum correlation. So what this is saying is, well, let me try and look for that gold code that has the largest correlation with the signal that I just transmitted. So for every gold code, I'm saying, let me look at all shifts. Of all of the shifts, let me then find the largest one. And then let me plot the largest correlation value for every gold code. Right? So here, I have 2,000 users. So I have 2,000 different gold codes. And I see this peak right here, right? This is very similar to what you did in the GPS problem, right? Does everyone remember making a plot like this? And now we're going to find the max of this. So what is the max of this? Well, where is that maximum peak? Where did you expect it to be? 29, right? What if we were to change this to be something else? What if we were to change? What, what index do you want to choose? Pick a number between 1 and 2,000. 1 is not going to look nice. Pick something that will look nice. 120. OK. Still have the same properties. Where is the shift going to be? What is the maximum correlation going to be at? OK. Now what are we going to do? So now we've figured out what the maximum shift is, right? We've figured out what the, what the what signal is in there, right? And we know what shift it was at, right? So we're going to find shift 1, which is that index is which, at which the correlation was the largest, right? So what is that shift? What do we expect that shift to be? Actually, let's print out shift 1, print shift 1, right? We had shifted it by 100, so we expect the maximum correlation shift to be 100. And now, what are we going to try and do? I have basically here, I have a vector. Oops. Um, so I figured out what tau 1 is, right? In my case, tau 1 was 100. And I have this vector that is now shifted by 100. I figured out what tau 1 was. So do I now know all of this? Right? I know S1, and I can shift it by tau 1 because I just figured it out. So I know what this is, and I know my received vector y. Now what can we do? <laughs> Now we can solve, right? We can solve using the only other algorithm that there is. Are th is this a case where there's n equations and n unknowns? How many unknowns are left? One. How many equations do we have? Hmm? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. How many equations do we have? We have n equations, right? Because the length of this vector is capital N. So there's n equations and one unknown. So what are we going to use? My second favorite algorithm, which is least squares. So our first step was to find the shift for max correlation you know, we got tau 1 this way. And now, the second thing is to solve. Is this mic working? Yes. Mic is not working. Hmm. If I speak really loudly, can you hear at the back? Kind of. OK. People at the webcast are going to be upset. Can 
Can I use this mic? Does this work? This also does not work. Okay. Um, solve this on your own. Does this work? Does this work? No. No. Does this work? Oh. Does this work? Okay, yay. Yeah, the people just touched it. Okay. Batteries work. Good. <laughs> anyway, so you've solved all, you've done the lesson of the lecture, right? We're done? Anyway. So what are we going to do now that we have a vector? Um, we have n equations and one unknown. So... We're going to do basically least squares in the one-dimensional case, right? I have basically uh, multiple different equations with the same unknown alpha. So I have this, and now I can print out what alpha is. And what do I get? Alpha is equal to 10. What was the signal strength that we had chosen? What was the value of alpha? Exactly 10, right? So great. This now works for the one signal case. But this means that only your peanut butter can talk to you, and nothing else. What about the coffee cup and the microwave? How do you have it so that you can actually have multiple signals combined together and all talking together at the same time? That's what we really want to try and figure out, right? Can we generalize? So here you're going to use least squares, basically, where, remember, least squares we used to set up ax equal to b, right? Our x here is the alpha. The a is like this s1 tau1. And the y is what you're measuring, which is like this b, right? And so what is the least square solution? You have x is equal to a transpose a inverse a transpose b. Right? This is the least square solution that you're just going to use in this case. But the question is now really, can you generalize? So what if now I have my y is equal to alpha i1 s1 tau i1. Alpha i2 s i2 tau i2 plus alpha i3. S I three tau I three. So again, watch the notation here. I'm writing now instead of I one two three, I'm writing this I one I two I three, right? These are my device names. So I'm using I one I two I three instead of one two three because I don't know 
if it's my microwave and my toaster and my fridge that are talking, or if it's my water bottle and my pen and my paper that are talking, right? So I need a way of representing the fact that the device ID as well is unknown, right? So that's why instead of, if I just said, well, it's the first device talking, then that would be by telling you which device is talking. So we're now generalizing even a little bit more to think about what if we don't know which device is talking, right? And in the first case, in the case of even one, you already did, you already figured out which device along with which shift by just cross-correlating with the gold codes of all of the devices. So here, now we want to try and understand this in the more general case. So let's think about what happens with three signals. With three signals, let's say, we have this, we have this equation and this setup, right? Where now instead of one, two, three, I would have I1, I2, I3, but basically the same set of equations is still going to hold it, pull us through, except now I have to figure out, uh, I want to know my unknowns are alpha I1, alpha I2, whoops, alpha I3, um, tau I1, tau I2, tau I3, right? And effectively, also I1, I2, I3, right? I don't actually know which devices are transmitted. And so I'm going to try and do this systematically and figure this out. And we're going to go back to the demo to try and try and do this. So what we're ha doing today is really a two-part lecture. We will not be finishing designing the entire algorithm in just one lecture, especially because we're going to be ending early today for the surveys. But today is also the day of technical difficulties. OK, great. So I want to, again, think about this in this setup. So I'm, it's exactly the same as before. I have the same length of each signal. I have 2,000 maximum users, except now we're actually going to use them. And here I'm thinking about, you know, let's take um, gold code number 23. We see the same thing, that when you hit the right shift, let's say the shift is 100, 23, inter inner product with signal 23, inner product with signal 23 at shift 100, you get this peak right at 100. But when you inner product it with a different song, you get nothing, no matter what the shift is. Remember, the x-axis here is the shift index, the y-axis is the correlation value. But now, let's say we have multiple things going on, right? We have different indices present. So we have devices 40, 100, and 312 that are transmitting. We have signal sense that they are transmitting, 10, 10, and 8. And we have these different shifts for each of these, right? And we want to recover these. So these are our unknowns, but because we're writing a simulation, we're you know putting them into the into the system. Are there any questions about what these variables are, index, signal strength, and shifts? Yeah? Are the signal strengths the same as the alphas? Yes, very good. These are the alphas. These are the taus. And these are the devices. Yeah? The alphas, were the alphas supposed to be one and negative one? So, so the gold codes have indices, um, like the, the, the elements of the gold code are plus one and minus one. So the gold code itself, if you look at it here, for example, is a list of plus ones and minus ones. But what I'm then doing is I'm taking, uh, when I'm defining my y vector, it's the signal strength, alpha, 
times the gold code. So the signal strength alpha can be any real number. So if you remember here, when we defined modulation, here we had alpha SI, right? Alpha could be any real number. SI is the gold code. Is that clear? Good question. Other questions about notation? There's a lot of notation. This is tricky and involved. And it's actually designed that we're doing together. So please ask questions. Everyone with me? OK. If you don't want to ask me a question, ask your neighbor. Do that. OK. So we're here. We have the devices, the alphas, and the taus. And now we're making this combo signal, which is our y, effectively which is basically the first signal strength times the first gold code shifted by the first index, so on and so forth. So we're basically creating this y is equal to alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 s2 plus alpha 3 s3, right? This is what this line is doing. And now we're seeing, can we do the same trick? Can we keep correlating to figure out which devices are there? So what is this going to generate? It's, again, looking at the correlations one by one of all of our 2,000 devices with the received signal Y, which is here called combo signal. So what this is doing is it's saying, well, let me look at the correlation of device zero. Uh, you can't see. Device zero at all different shifts, OK? And then let me find the max across all of the different shifts. That's what's being plotted here. So there's two operations. One is you take a correlation. So you generate a plot like this. You generate a plot like this. And then you take this maximum value. And that's what you plot here. Then for the next code, you generate a plot like this. You take the maximum value. And you plot it here. And as you see, most of the values plotted here are close to 0 which means that most of the correlations look entirely like this. There's very few that look like this with one strong peak. How many, in fact, are there that have strong peaks? Based on this. How many peaks are there? Three, right? So how many devices had a correlation at some shift that was different from 0? Three, right? So three of the plots looked like this. Everything else looked like this. All this loop is doing is it's generating these, these kind of plots. Right here, the x-axis is the shift index. Here, the x-axis is the user ID, right? Don't confuse these two plots. They look similar. But here, it's going from 0 to 2,000. Here, it's going from 0 to 400. Are people with me that these two kinds of plots are different? Yeah, question. Um, <clears throat> why are the max values not the same every time we do the correlation? If because the graph is normalized? Great question. This is because we're multiplying by these alphas. right? If we weren't multiplying by the alphas, our co max correlation would always be 1. But we, weren't, we aren't. right? We have alpha 1 s1 plus alpha 2 s2 plus alpha 3 s3. Question? No. OK. So now you see this, and you see what are the device IDs that you can pick out, right? So you see, well, where are these max correlations coming from? So here I'm saying, let me find the values of these three peaks. That's all this block of code is doing. Print out these three max values, and it's saying it's at 140 and 312. Great. So now what are we going to do? Again, now we have the ability to set up a least squares problem, right? Because now what this does is it gives me s1, tau1, s2, tau2, s3, tau3, because I figured out which are the three devices. And I figured out what shift they're correlating at. I figured out both of these unknowns. So I now know this guy. I received this guy. I recorded it. So again, what am I going to be able to do? least squares, right? I have an ax equal to b. And that's basically what I'm going to actually set up here. 
So I'm taking basically my three uh, vectors, which are basically the index max1, max2, and max3, and I'm taking the codes for max1, max2, and max3. And I'm using the shifts that we decoded. So we can actually print out these guys. Uh, print shift one, for example. So if I do this, you'll see that the shift of the first guy was 20. Um, here I can print shift two. Print shift three. So these are the three shifts, which is what we actually had. So now this gives us the taus. We figured out the taus. We figured out the device IDs. Now we can just run least squares, right? I just define my function least squares. And what do I get out when I call least squares on basically this is the first vector that I found, the second vector, and the third vector. So I'm just stacking them up into become make the matrix A. My B is the combo signal, and I run least squares, and I get, what do I get out? 10, 10, 8, what were the signals that we had actually um, encoded? What were the alphas? 10, 10, 8, right? So we, we did this in two steps. But the thing that I actually want you to see that actually gets us to the heart of the OMP algorithm is, does this always work? And we're going to end class on somewhat of a cliffhanger here. Um, so let's try this again, right? We see here that we were able to recover these three uh, alphas using this technique of you know, first do correlation, then find the shifts, and then oops, first do the correlations, then find the shifts, and then use least squares, right? This is what we've done so far, every single time. Um, the question is, can we make sure that this will always work every single time? Any questions about this? Is, is this clear, what we've done? Is this part, this two-step algorithm clear? This is not the OMP algorithm, but is it clear that by correlating, you can find the shifts and the device IDs based on the peaks? Once you find the peaks, you just run standard least squares. That's like the basic algorithm. So now I'm going to do this again, except for a slightly different set of values. So here, I'm going to say, let's say there's four devices. Device ID is 40, 100, 3, 1, 12, and 350. And we have signal strengths that are alpha 1 is 100, 10, 8, and you know this tiny number, 0 0.02. And then we're going to create, again, this combo signal that adds up alpha 1, S1, alpha 2, S2, so on and so forth. And now we are going to, again, find this max correlation. We're going to do what we did, right? What did we do? We try to figure out which device ID is in there by shifting and correlating. Yeah? Um, yeah, actually, you're right. Yep, this is the device names. The index present is the device names. And these are the signal strengths. Thank you. So we have these indices, we have these alphas, then we're adding up the signal, right? We have alpha 1, uh, S1, alpha 2, S2, alpha 3, S3. I really wish we had a blackboard in this room, but they, we don't. Um, OK, so now we are here. You're just doing exactly what we did before, is finding those max correlations. And now we're going to plot them. How many peaks do you expect to see, given that there are four signals? Four. How many peaks do you see? One. So can we use, like, how do we figure out? Can we use the same trick we used last time? This is suddenly not working. Why is this not working? What kind of values did we choose here? 
there's a huge difference between the types of alphas, right? Basically what's happening is like, you know, we're getting this value for device ID 40 close to 100, but kind of everything else is so small. It's being drowned out by that 100. So if you're in a classroom and someone is talking really, really loudly and you can, or you're at a cocktail party and you're hearing some, and someone's talking really loudly, how can you try to maybe hear other smaller sounds or signals that are around you? What is a natural thing you want to try and do? What do, what did, what do noise canceling headphones do? Get them out, right? Great. You try to get them out. If someone's being too loud, you try to get them out. So what do you want to do to this signal that is being too loud? Get them out. So you're going to do that. You're going to find this max guy. And I'm going to find exactly the shift at which this is there. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I can see your max value is at 100. And I know your device ID. I know your shift. And so I'm going to take you out of my received signal. I'm going to delete you. Right? I have what I call the residue, which is removing this. Now let's repeat the correlation and see what we get. What do you see now? Two more peaks, right? What is the value of these peaks? Is the value now 100? No, it's about 10 and about 8. And if we look at what we had put down, we had the next two values that were about 10 and about 8. But do we see our last guy? Not yet. So now, what do we want to do again? Get them out. out. So we do this. Now we remove the second peak. And... We'll remove that. We take the second peak. We take the second peak here. We remove that. Alpha 1 times the first vector. Alpha 2 times the second vector. Now what do we have? Now we have one peak. Can we still see the fourth vector? Not quite, right? Let's take this out as well. Now what happened? We've taken out the top three peaks. We still can't quite see our last 0.02 value, right? Now it's like looking like garbage. How do I tell which one is actually the peak? Suddenly more peaks are starting to appear. How to solve this problem is exactly what we are going to do in OMP. And we will pick this up next time. You will talk about it in discussion. Um, I want to stop. Class is not over. We're going to have HKN come in and do a survey. This is why I have to actually end class a little bit early. Um, but we will pick up basically exactly at this point um, at the beginning of class on, on Thursday. So you have a lot of time to think about how are you going to solve this problem? What do you do when all of the alphas are very, very different from each other? Um, HKN, do you want to come up? Doing these surveys is really important for us, so I would appreciate if people were going to stay here and actually complete the survey. It's just 10 minutes of your time. I really ask that you not leave. Hello. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Alexander Wu, and I'm from HKN. So uh, we are going to do course evaluations. It, you, uh, in the past, we sent a paper form to do course evaluations, but now everything's online, so it should be much easier, and you should do it. <laughs> uh, course evaluations are actually very important. They are used to improve course content, for hiring and the instructors will look at all of your comments 
and they will look at it after your grades have been determined, and and they will not be able to identify you. So you don't need to worry about being identified. You should uh, be candid, fill everything out, and uh, they are due on December 9th. So we have 15 minutes. Right now would be a great time to fill them out if you haven't already. And... Okay, please pull out your laptops, tablets, and phones, and uh, you should have received an email. If you haven't, you can go to course-evaluations.berkeley.edu, and I can answer any questions if you have them. And I'll try to pull up the TA list after a while. So does anyone have any questions? Um, I am not sure about that, but you should still fill it out. Yes? It's a different survey. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's a different survey. Uh, if you go t uh, for the TA's evaluations, please fill out the TA that uh, you go to, not the one you enrolled in. So any TA that you have had meaningful interactions with you should fill out uh, an evaluation for them. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, sorry? Uh, could you speak up? It's in your... Uh, you can search in your email course evaluations or go to course-evaluations.berkeley.edu. Uh, if you've already filled it out. Yeah. Yes. Yes, as long as you click submit, it is... Yes. Did you go to the um, the website? The website? Yeah. No, um, course stash evaluation. Yeah, it's basically got everything except X forty seven D. Hmm. All of my other classes are on there. You might send an email to uh, HKN. Okay. Um, it's it's Jesse at hkn.eats.berkeley.edu I didn't find that somewhere. Uh, I don't know where you could I don't know where the email is publicly if you could uh, write it down or something uh, you can go on HKN website HKN yeah. website probably has a VP and stuff I'm not sure if they have Jesse they do have Jesse they have the emails for all the um, for all the uh, Rose. Yeah, for all the, what do you call them? <laughs> Community. Oh, yeah. Um, the professor wanted me to tell you that if you're having office hours is 144, I asked you to announce it. Oh. Instead of 212, it's 144. Uh, also, office hours will be at one, wait, what was it? 144. 144. Do you know how to project this? Yeah, they've all left, but I said I would, uh, I don't know how to practice. Yeah, it's okay. I figured yesterday, the, 
press only gave me like six minutes to do it. <laughs> it was pretty sad. But yeah, I signed up really late. So it was like, it was, so I signed up for CSAD. It was a small, smaller class. Okay. Okay. I don't know. I think it probably is. It was just starting when. Yeah. I walked out, but I was too lazy to go back to that. How does this thing work? So you don't worry about it. Are you going to put in your laptop or do you don't need to? Uh, well. Because we're having a problem with the HDMI. Oh, because it's. Did you try this one? 